and welcome to The One Show with Matt Baker. And Alex Jones. Now, as we all know, the Defence Secretary, Liam Fox, is now out of his job. Who could have seen that one come in? Hmm. Fox, I don't know, by the time this goes out, he may not be in a job anymore. Because the Prime Minister said he had his full support. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. It's Ian Hislop. <laughs> have been quite a gift for you and Paul at the beginning of a new series. Yes, it was fabulous. It was real fish in a barrel. Yeah. Well, fox in a barrel, as it turned out. Gave um, you plenty of material. Yeah, no, it was very funny and it was very obvious he was going to go. Um, right. And he did, so I look as though I'm sort of Mystic Meg. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did, you did. It's incredible you've done every episode. Yes, that's just fear. Yeah. Um, you haven't missed one at all. <laughs> no. Well, as well as Have I Got News For You, Ian is, of course, the editor of Private Eye, which is currently celebrating its 50th anniversary. More on that a little bit later on, including uh, what the Prime Minister thinks of it. Yes, also, <laughs> we will be meeting... <laughs> well, Dr Sarah is here to tell us more in a little bit. But first, Ian, it's an interesting time, isn't it, this, when you've got, obviously, surgeons who are using knives and then you've got robots that are doing similar jobs. Yeah. Where, what, what, what are your thoughts on being operated on by a robot? Um, I'm perfectly happy, providing, you know, it's assessed by the other robots and um, <laughs> we've got all the data there and I know how he's doing. Um, that'll do fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sarah, in what other ways, then, are robots being used in hospitals? Oh, it's remarkable. There are all sorts of things that... You know, some of them are a little bit more counterintuitive, should we say, than others. Yes. Right. Pharmacies? Lots and lots of drugs dispensed every minute of every day. There's a hospital in Scotland which reckons it has saved £700,000 of its drug bill by yeah. using an automated system to dispense all its drugs. Now, there have to be lots of backups because nobody else can read the barcodes. No. Right. A bit embarrassing. Well, well that, I mean, that, that's understandable, kind of in dispensing, you know, medicine mm. and stuff like that. But what about actual treatment? Oh, well, there's a really exciting one, which is still in a bit more of an experimental phase. Yeah. But this is called a cyber knife, and it's incredibly pinpoint accuracy and you can get to tumours with surgical therapy and sort of x-ray beams that you could never treat before that actually you probably couldn't have operated on before. Yeah so this is definitely a move forward but then yeah. the more bizarre one is a doctor who's, whose face you see but it, literally it's a robot. It that does one. look a bit like a Dalek. You it does look. Seeing. Yeah let's have a little look. <laughs> Now, this is Robo-Doc, <laughs> isn't it? Well, it's a robot doctor, and I have to say, you do slightly feel someone's going to jump out and say, April Fool, but actually it does do a little <laughs> bit more than act as a sort of high-tech video camera because they've got stethoscopes, they can wire you up, and the doctor 100 miles away can listen to you. Now, that's great. If... What's its bedside manner like? <laughs> <laughs> Sympathetic, caring? It's been assessed by another robot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually called an RP7, isn't it? It is, and it's being used in very rural areas. But with all these problems in the NHS. I mean, is this just technology, you know, expensive technology for its own sake? Well, some of it, of course, has already paid for itself in a big way, like the dispenser. But we have to bear in mind that things that we took for, you know, gr take for granted today, like telescopic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, which yeah. means mm. people get out of hospital quicker, they have fewer complications. 20 years ago, they were fringe medicine. Now, of course, we were young then, but, you know, for some people, that's a long time ago. Mm. Yeah, okay, well, Ian, if everybody is going to be replaced by a robot, we thought we'd better design one uh, for you. And have a look at it. This is the Ian Hisbot 2000. <laughs> Here we go. Look, there's a scandal handle on uh, there. There's a sarcasm <laughs> unit. <laughs> there's a cash dispenser uh, for lawyers. Yeah, and a peer <laughs> for him. Alarm. Yeah, there you go. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, we That's wonder... obviously more effective than me. Well, <laughs> I think there you that's go. it. You said it. <laughs> Redundant again. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sarah. Lovely to see you. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Private Eye is celebrating its 50th birthday. Yeah, Giles Brandreth takes a look back at half a century of satire, scandal... And solicitor's fees. At the beginning of the 1960s, some senior politicians were saying that as a nation, we'd never had it so good. Other people were saying, <laughs> a raspberry was blown in the face of an ageing post-war government that seemed to have run out of steam. British politicians were being treated with less respect and more scepticism. So in the decade that would bring Americans their summer of love, we Brits got there first with the summer of satire. Spearheading this very British revolution was Private Eye. It began life as a school magazine at Shrewsbury School and was the brainchild of Willie Rushton, Chris Booker, Richard Ingrams and Paul Foote. Ingrams and Foote went on to study at Oxford and it was here that the magazine proper finally went to print. The first issue was published on October the 25th, 1961, costing sixpence. 
Back then, 300 copies were distributed to coffee houses around Soho. Now, it costs £1.50 and sells around 200,000 copies a fortnight. The single image on the magazine's cover became its trademark, while inside, readers found a mixture of current affairs, cultural reviews, satirical cartoons, and now famous but previously unreported scandals in sections such as HP Source. Times have changed since the magazine's first publication, but its offices in Soho haven't. The offices are in this very seedy corner of Soho, but I think that's a healthy thing that everyone should be reminded of the squalor of the world as they pass through the door. Today's editor was reported to be the most sued man in Britain, Ian Hislop. Right at the beginning, what was Private Eye? In the beginning, I think it was the jokes. It was disrespectful jokes about um, people and institutions that traditionally people had been very deferent about. I think after that, the stories got people going, and so suddenly you had this double-barrelled effect. And then came satire. What did satire mean in those days? It meant a new attitude of questioning, a new attitude of disrespect to a society which, um, the end of the 50s in Britain, had been pretty deferent. And that was rather shocking. Um, so that's how the magazine set up. Can you go too far? Can you be too inflammatory? Um, I think you can. I mean, I try hard not to be, because then I think you lose people. Um, and I think what you need to do is to be able to justify the joke. Not only has it poked fun at the nation's elite, Private Eye was also a pioneer in investigative journalism and soon gained a reputation for running stories that were too controversial for mainstream papers. I think when you look back at the 50 years, people will point out to the Profumo case, the great Robert Maxwell um, saga. They'll probably look at the Bristol Heart scandal, which the eye was in the middle of. Some of the stuff that looks duller but actually makes a huge impact on your life. We have been there banging away. As a consequence of its intrepid reporting, Private Eye has been the recipient of many a libel writ. Private Eye was involved in one of the largest libel payouts in British legal history. Sonia Sutcliffe, wife of the Yorkshire Ripper, was awarded £600,000 after the Eye accused her of cashing in on her husband's notoriety. When the appeal pointed out that this was more than twice what the victim's families had received, the fine was slashed to £60,000 and sparked a reform in libel law. Torin Douglas is media correspondent for the BBC. Private Eye has been the court jester, prepared to say things that other people aren't prepared to say. Funny, but also with a serious intent, so that it actually exposes um, uh, the great and the good uh, and all their foibles. There have been times when it's been very strong, other times when you feel it's, uh, it, it's far less relevant. I think the fact that it's a funny magazine, a satirical magazine, has sometimes detracted from its journalism because you don't know what is actual fact uh, and what is just a bit of a joke. Love it or hate it, Private Eye has now been around for half a century, telling the stories which other magazines and newspapers either couldn't or wouldn't. I know from my time in politics that the media can be a cruel mistress, but if satire is indeed telling the truth with a smile on your face, then I'm all in favour of it. Good grief, what's this? God, and this? £4.50, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Interesting cover. Was that fact or a bit of a joke? Mm, he must have got <laughs> some real dirt on Giles. And he's done it himself. Ah, <laughs> I tell you what, if you haven't, we've got plenty of scandal. Okay, I'll you see can you have afterwards. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Just a small fee. Well, <laughs> Ian, 50 years for the magazine, 25 <laughs> years for you, but it was an appointment that wasn't welcomed by all of the, uh, the journalists there, was it? Was yes, the um, there was, I mean, some um, muttering um, an attempted coup, but honestly, I mean, I was 26, um, mm. and looking back, I think... Good grief, why did they give him the job? Um, but luckily I survived, um, and I'm still here to tell the tale. Yeah, and to celebrate the 50th anniversary, you've brought out a couple of books. Which we you have. have here. Yeah. Also an exhibition at the v &A in London. Yes. And as editor, you've picked out 50 covers uh, for the exhibition. Yes. But what's your personal favourite, then? Well, um, I'm very keen on um, a gotcha cover. Have you got that one? We uh, have. We that have, is. here yes. we are. Uh, um, gotcha was a headline The Sun ran at the sinking of the Belgrano oh, in the middle okay. of the Falklands War. It was sort of uh, the Murdoch press at its worst. And I've, in my head, thought for about 20 years, one day I'm going to put Gotcha <laughs> on a cover over a picture of Murdoch um, when finally someone has got him. Um, and so all these years later I thought, 
we've got you. Um, him, him, his yeah, son yeah, and yeah, Rebecca yeah. Brooks. So I'm particularly keen on that one. And it says underneath, Murdoch goes down with all hacks. And that one is actually on the annual as well. It is. It's, it's, it's all over the place. <laughs> but you'll find a, this is a very good history by one of our journalists called Adam McQueen. It's at least 45 years um, the eye's been having a look at Murdoch. Um, so that's what you get with us. Repetition and a refusal to give up. <laughs> well, you, you talked in that film about pushing taste and decency, but yes. you did get into trouble, didn't you, in 97, uh, with a Diana cover. Yes. Do you regret that now? Or... Uh, no, I'm, I'm still um, actually rather proud of that. I mean, I did feel that the, the country had slipped into a sort of grief hysteria. Um, and um, I felt it was important. I mean, it's never terribly successful saying to the general public, I think you're wrong, um, and making yeah, them yeah. the subject, the joke. But from the reaction afterwards and when the hysteria died down, I think mm. what we managed to do was inject a certain note of sanity. Mm. And it was people literally going around saying, how upset are you? You're not very upset. Right, mm. string him up. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a bit... Uh, a bit un-British, really. But the problem is, if you've seen us too soft, then it seems that you're part of the establishment you're trying to ridicule. Have a look at this. Mm. I used to read it as a teenager, and it, it is a thorn in the side of politicians, no question. It makes people in power ridiculous, and it makes... Uh, it, it, it keeps everything in kind of perspective. There are definitely front covers that I've seen and thought, oh, my God, how could they, you know... There are moments like that, but it's fun. The main thing is it's funny, and if you can't laugh at yourself... You probably shouldn't do this job. And it will go, continue to go from strength to strength. Mm. <laughs> now, that little look from Ed Miliband at the end is quite interesting. Let's just, let's just see that again. If this was a cover, what, what, what would you put in that bubble? <laughs> do you think he meant it, what he said, though? Well, if Miliband's saying we're going from strength to strength, then we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more or less the end of the eye. They are incredibly rude politicians. They know how to hurt, don't they? Cameron's saying he thinks it's funny. Oh, makes you there want you to go. give up. Well, you can, you can uh, that screw and now. Clegg, Clegg likes it. But what about next week? Will he change his mind? Ooh, Ooh. we'll see. But how do stories get in then? I mean, how much work, how much worry do you do about stories being truthful before they go into the magazine? Well, there's no point in having stories in the magazine if people don't believe they're mm. true. So people have this idea, oh, it's in the eye, it must be rubbish. No, everything I print I believe is true. Because otherwise, why would you read it? Yeah. And we've got lots of other papers for that. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, Ian has uh, shone a light into the lives of powerful people for the last 25 years.